This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Yes, we welcome you to another edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. So glad you tuned in. As always, we are your hosts for the next 30 minutes. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Honestly, 30 minutes isn't enough to cover everything we have for you today, but we plan to get it all in. Straight ahead, the FAA makes its final ruling on the use of commercial drones, and that includes agriculture, the important steps you need to take before flying. Also on the program, a warning for hay producers after UGA Extension reports significant damage from Bermuda grass stem maggots. Plus, join us as we hit the road to Helen, Georgia, and tour a Georgia icon, the Nora Mill Granary. These stories and so much more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, the good news for Georgia peach growers is that this year's crop of sweet Georgia peaches has far exceeded anyone's expectations. The mild winter had many producers concerned and even fearful of what this year's pickings might bring. But as Duke Lane Jr. of Lane Southern Orchards recently told me, it's important to always remember the lessons of our forefathers. You know, like my granddad, my granddad and my dad and I heard all these old, old, old peach growers say, uh, a peach will promise you the most and give you the least and promise you the least and give you the most. Well, this one of these years, it has promised the least and has given us the most. Yes, the pickings in Fort Valley this year are very good. So good that Duke Lane Jr. says to date, he's already reached 100% of his projections, meaning the stockpile of sweet Georgia peaches is plentiful and ripe for the taking. However, Lane also warns of a future slowdown. As we get on into August, uh, get on to July, the middle of July and August, we're going to have a couple of little periods there where we're going to be low on fruit because some varieties just didn't get enough cold weather to enable them to, for the leaves to come out to support the, the blooms. And if, if they don't, if that doesn't happen, the blooms will actually abort, they'll fall off tree and you'll have a great big old nice tree full of leaves, but you won't have any fruit. So, you know, but given the situation, I mean, we've been, we started uh, May 13th this year and we've been going at it, you know, just about nonstop, you know, so. We, we got a lot to be thankful because this, uh, you talked to any of the growers and we were all, you know, very, very cautiously optimistic when we started the season, uh, knowing that we didn't have a very, what we call a, a good solid winter here in middle Georgia. Although opinions may vary, every year at this time, the question is raised, what exactly is the perfect peach? And is there really such a thing? Well, according to Duke Lane, it's really a matter of science and timing. You know, the optimal thing is leave these peaches on the trees to the last minute. And then at that time you come in and pick them, knowing that we can get them to uh, most anywhere on the East Coast in two days. So, you know, basically it's, a, it's, a, it's an art to it. I mean, people just can't come out here and grow peaches and when they get a few red peaches start picking. I mean, it's really a, a science to know when to pick them and what's, what's, uh, what, what, are the, what does the customer want? What are they looking to buy? What are they expecting to receive on the other end? When these peaches come out of these orchards, go to the packing house, leave there in trucks and head to many destinations uh, away from us. Aside from a successful harvest, something else that has everyone at Lane excited is a new sourcing policy by Harvey Supermarkets, which focuses on providing support to local growers, not only in Georgia, but throughout the Southeast. You know, they all want to be involved in, in the initiative that Gary Black started in, in Georgia Grown, uh, who's your farmer, where can I get local, locally grown stuff, stuff that I know is going to be good. Haven't been on back of a truck coming from California for four days. And it's, uh, it's going to be fresh when I get it. And it's going to be, you know, fresher when I eat it. In Fort Valley, I'm Ray D'Alessio for the Georgia Farm Monitor. In other ag news, farmers wishing to incorporate drones into their daily operations now have some clarity after the FAA recently announced its final guidelines regarding the use of commercial drones. A check of some of those guidelines, drones weighing less than 55 pounds can begin flying in August with a maximum altitude of 400 feet. Operators must be at least 16 years of age and have a remote pilot certificate and must keep sight of the drone at all times. Again, these are just a few of the guidelines and do not apply to drone operators who just want to fly as a hobby. For a complete list of rules and regulations regarding the use of commercial drones, log on to FAA.gov and scroll down to the section titled Small Unmanned Aircraft Systems. 
Before you know it, another Sunbelt Expo will be upon us. This year, they will be celebrating their 39th annual show, which is set for October 18th through 20th. Prior to that, Expo Field Day is for Thursday, July 14th. It's free and open to those involved in agriculture and agribusiness. Registration begins at 715, followed by a complimentary biscuit breakfast, exhibit viewing, and welcome from the Georgia Department of Agriculture and Georgia Farm Bureau. Organizers say all the plots are planted and will be in great shape for field day. Of course, good research is crucial in making sure farmers stay profitable and consumers have safe and plentiful food supply. Yeah, recently, members of Georgia Farm Bureau's Farm to Fork Tour got a chance to visit a very important research facility operated by UGA in Watkinsville. The Monitor's Mark Wildman has the story. Most consumers probably do not realize the importance of a facility like the J. Phil Campbell Senior Research and Education Center in Watkinsville. When you drive by the buildings, they may not strike you as a place that is very important to Georgia's economy. But the work being done here is helping sustain Georgia's number one industry. Superintendent of the facility, Eric Elsner, works hard along with researchers and other staff to help advance agriculture in Georgia. I think this facility is extremely important to the mission of the college. Uh, it gives an opportunity for multiple researchers and multiple disciplines to be able to uh, study sustainable agriculture, sustainable grazing systems, and also sustainable cropping systems. During the Farm to Fork Tour, Georgia Farm Bureau members got a chance to see firsthand how these fields help farmers and consumers. I hope uh, people get an understanding that there are other ways to do things. Uh, there are no black and whites in agriculture. There are, are always a group of people that are looking to make things better for you. They can make your operation more profitable, more sustainable, more environmentally sustainable. And coming here hopefully gives those folks an opportunity to see some of those options they have. Dr. Dennis Hancock shared information on research done on alfalfa mixed with Bermuda grass for livestock to graze on. And it's really been a game changer for them, reducing cost, uh, growing their own nitrogen, and basically growing their own supplement as well. And their cattle, their livestock are in really great shape, their profitability is up, and overall it's uh, been a really great thing for their operation. This field has been grazed down so the forage is not high but the results are very promising, and all of the hard work put into good research will help farmers for generations to come. Uh, some of the work has been done in North Georgia and South Georgia for, for 20 years plus now, but we're really getting to a point now where we have the right combination of varieties, uh, pest control methods, um, uh, harvest techniques, and that sort of thing that really make this a reality. Those involved in UGA Ag Research Projects look forward to sharing their information with groups like this one from Georgia Farm Bureau. Georgia Farm Bureau is a great advocate for our industry as well as for supporting our uh, uh, research and education efforts here and especially our extension efforts in trying to get uh, uh, the word out to our producers about some of the unique and new ideas that we have that have really uh, panned out quite well for us. Georgia is very fortunate to be able to grow forage well, and the state is also very fortunate to have good research that works hard to enhance Georgia's livestock industry. The ultimate goal on any beef cattle operation is to have a calf on the ground every 365 days, and the dairy operation to have more milk in the milk tank, and the, the horse operation is to have better, healthier animals. And, and alfalfa in the Bermuda grass, or alfalfa in general, makes that a reality for us. The quality of the forage is better, the animals are in better condition, and uh, they breed back, they produce more milk, they produce more meat. Uh, it's, it's overall a win-win for the whole sector. Reporting from Watkinsville, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, still to come on the program, the warning UGA Extension has for hay producers after numerous reports of damage from Bermuda grass stem maggots. But first, when the monitor continues, we head to Helen, Georgia, and tour a fully operational grist mill, one of the few that still grind corn to this day. Stay tuned. I often joke and say I was born into the FFA. My daddy is an FFA advisor, and so I've tagged along with him since the time I was born to different FFA events. So once I hit middle school and 
was able to get involved in FFA, of course, I was extremely excited and couldn't wait to take hold of all the opportunities. After finishing my last year at Ware County High School, I plan to go to ABAC and start to get a degree in ag education. To learn more about the National FFA organization, log on to ffa.org. As long as there have been cotton fields, there have been ups and downs. Prices rise and then they fall. Challenges and hard times come and then they go. But no matter what else happens, cotton is always there. Because these soft white fields have always provided one of our most renewable, sustainable resources. One that Americans have relied upon for centuries to clothe us and provide for our families and still do today. For 50 years, a public-private partnership formed by U.S. cotton producers has worked tirelessly to ensure that the future of cotton is always in capable hands. Because we know we can't just rely on what has worked in the past. We have to look forward to innovations in food production, to breakthroughs in fiber technology. The possibilities for cotton are limitless, and together, we are funding cutting-edge scientific research, award-winning advertising campaigns, and state-of-the-art manufacturing techniques to help this trusted, reliable crop find new markets for generations to come. This resource is renewable, and so is our future. It's time to renew your faith in cotton. A special message from our friends at Cotton Incorporated and the Plant Management Network. Now, they've teamed up to bring the cotton growing community a series of Focus on Cotton webcasts. For more information, log on to plantmanagementnetwork.com. Once there, click on the Focus on Cotton webcast. In the meantime, this summer, a lot of tourists will visit the mountains of North Georgia. Yeah, we found one stop that may be of interest. You will find an operational grist mill in the foothills of White County. The Nora Mill Granary first opened in 1876. You'll find it sitting alongside the beautiful Chattahoochee River in White County, just outside of Helen. 140 years old. We are. It, it is. It is the same way that it was done 140 years ago. It is, we are still completely water powered, completely operational, same stone, same turbine. We we are producing whole grain products, all done in house, n nothing added, and no, no preservatives, none of that, and we are. It's good quality product, and to say that we're still doing it the way they were doing it 140 years ago, still water powered right off the river behind us. Where do we get our corn? We get it from Kentucky. We need the same corn every time. Unfortunately, in Georgia, there's only a handful of people that do food grade corn. Most of it's agricultural ethanol. And ours has to be dried different for the aflatoxins. We need a certificate of analysis with our corn. It's not like it used to where everybody brought corn in here. There's nobody around here that grows enough corn. Last fiscal year, we did almost 350,000 pounds of corn. Martin has been helping produce grits from corn at the mill since the 1980s. I'm, right now we're grinding grits on a 1876 working grist mill. The, it's powered by an actual water turbine from Rome, Georgia, 1876 outside. 50 times more powerful than a paddle wheel. The stones are from the Marne River Valley in France, 1876. These are pink granite from the Marne River Valley. The corn is brought over up grain elevators to my hopper, drops in via the shaker, goes in between the two stones. The two stones I can adjust to make it coarser or finer. And you never let the two stones touch. You never want the two stones to touch. So once I get it down to the proper depth, I start checking the smell. I smell to make sure that the two stones aren't touching. I'm smelling for the grindstone. The only way to make the stones last is by keeping your nose to the grindstone, stay focused, and everything will be all right. But you have to keep your nose to the grindstone.
Nora Mills in the Nakuchi Village has become a regular tourist stop for many folks that spend time in the mountains. Tommy Martin spends a lot of his time talking to visitors and tourists as they stop at Nora Mills. He said telling the story of the mill and how it still works is the favorite part of his job. And it was just a natural fit for me and I'm just real blessed to be around. I got to work for Grandpa too, who was born in 1897. A lot of my local history, if you want to know about history, come in here and ask me. I get talking about the mill, and if the people are wanting to really uh, hear the history, I'll bother them with it. And if not, they, they sort of start walking away from me. But the, a lot of the history I learned, I've spoken at uh, historical societies, but a lot of that history was from the old timers. And I've worked now for four generations of this family. Well, just a reminder, if you missed any part of the story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel. That's the Georgia Farm Monitor. Once there, you can browse the archive of stories dating as far back as 2009. And of course, once you're done watching all those informative stories, just keep on clicking and like the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page we have set up for you. If you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, feel free to send us a message either on Facebook or at the address listed below. That is news at farm-monitor.com. When we come back, family owned and operated since 1935, why the folks at Hardy Farms decided to add a roasting division, that's next when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. Hi, I'm Matthew London uh, from Cleveland, Georgia, and we're blessed to be here at the Nakuchi Indian Mound here in Helen. Uh, our family has been blessed over the last 30 years to be able to lease this property from the Hardman family and through the state of Georgia. The Indian Mound uh, is a state park associated with the Hardman farm across the street. It was uh, transferred from the Hardman family to the state of Georgia in the mid 2000s. The gazebo was um, placed upon the Cherokee Indian Mound uh, in the late 19th century by uh, Captain Nichols uh, that owned the property at that time. Uh, the mound has been excavated in 1915 and 2004 uh, through grants and uh, most of the stuff that was found was put into the Smithsonian. Um, we farm approximately 2,000 head of Holstein and Jersey heifers uh, from ages 100 days old to eight months bred. And we sell them to dairy farmers from North Carolina all the way through to Florida. And we raise all the crops for these cattle, including the grass you see behind me. Uh, 225 to 250 acres of hay and over 300 acres of corn silage annually. Uh, we, t we strive to produce all the forages for our cattle and we buy uh, commodity feeds as well from all over the southeast to help make a balanced diet for our heifers. I'm truly blessed to be able to work alongside my dad and granddad. Um, I'm very fortunate, I really am. Um, they've instilled in hard work in me and um, there's no two. There's two other guys. There's no two other guys that have worked harder than my dad and granddad. And I very cher I cherish the the chance and opportunity to work with them daily. I think in the next five to ten years, the big promotion of farming uh, has to has to occur uh, for us to continue to to reach the non-farming community and promote agriculture in the right way. Always good to hear from Matthew. These little creatures, however, not so much. Hey producers, listen up. UGA Extension is reporting that Bermuda grass stem maggots are on the rise and spreading quickly throughout the state. They say that stem maggot injury has been reported as significant in several counties in a line south of Jessup over to Albany. BJ Marks, a hay producer in Newton County, says the one good thing about these pests, though, compared to others, is that it can quickly be contained. The Bermuda stem maggot has a 12 day cycle that it's in this Bermuda. So if you can catch it within the first couple of days when the larvae is being laid, you can actually get it killed and, and, and not quite so detrimental to your crop. You're gonna have some loss, but if you see it, you can get it stopped to prevent it from rooting your whole crop. Luckily with the Bermuda stem maggot, is it's still at a point that they can be controlled with any kind of the pyrethroids, uh, Malathion, Seven, um, which is a good thing because we, we've run into some, some, stu some stuff with some of the other pests that they become a little bit more resistant to it. So we're, we're very fortunate, we're very lucky right now that, that what we have is working. But I tell you, with the drought that we're having this year and, and the population in South Georgia, we know they're coming. We're just trying to prepare the best we can when they get here.
And if you have any questions about the Bermuda stem maggot or any other pests for that matter, visit georgiaforages.com or contact your local UGA County Extension office. Finally today, known throughout the state for their boiled peanuts, in 2014, Hardy Farms decided to expand the operation to include a roasting division. Now, recently, the farm monitor's Damon Jones made a trip to Hawkinsville and tells you how they get the product from the field to the shelves. For decades, Hardy Farms has specialized in producing the most southern of foods, the boiled peanut. However, those who live outside the south have likely never heard of, much less tasted, this product. That's why this family-owned business recently decided to add a roasting division to their company. Roasted peanuts has literally opened the world to us. I mean, now we sell peanuts to, uh, to candy companies in Chicago and California and New York City and New Jersey, and that never would happen with a boiled peanut. So, so literally what we're doing over here, it's like I said, it's opening the world to us. And, and it's a brand new world for us also because we're used to the boiled peanut world. While it might be a different way of preparing them, the roasting division also takes great pride in using the freshest peanuts available. What we do is we buy from the Georgia market. Everything we do is Georgia grown. Um, we get a shelled product in. Sometimes it's a variety of Georgia grown peanuts, mostly jumbo varieties. Um, we do uh, uh, the typical blanched peanuts. We also do some smaller peanuts for candy companies. Unlike most of the peanuts you see in the grocery store, Hardy Farms oil roasts theirs in this machine that cooks the peanuts at 320 degrees. It's a process that enhances the flavor of the product. We do not dry roast here, we oil roast. So we roast our peanuts in oil. Uh, even on our Hardy Farms bags, they will say fried Georgia peanuts. We're cooking peanut oil and uh, it helps seal the flavor in the oil, uh, of the peanut itself and it's a little bit more of a moist uh, nut taste. You still get a good crunch but it has a good flavorful taste to it. While Hardy Farms is hoping to add dry roasting to the business in the near future, demand for their oil roasted peanuts has grown in the two years since the division has been opened. Uh, within 2015, we did about a million and a half pounds of peanuts through this facility. Uh, in 2016, we're on course to do between two to three million pounds. Uh, so, so we're definitely on the right track. And with this being a startup operation, Hardy Farms is able to attract a number of companies that are largely ignored by the big corporations. The one good thing, a niche that we're finding that we're, we're able to help is a lot of these companies that are buying pallets to four or five pallets at the time. Uh, you know, some of these very large companies that are doing what we do, and there's only a few on the, in the whole country that do this, especially on the East Coast, they've gotten so large that they only want to deal with the large customers. Another advantage is the attention to detail they can provide. That's both in the customer service and quality control. When they pick up the phone, they talk to me or they talk to my director of operations. They don't talk to some salesman that's sitting in an office somewhere. So we're able to give good personalized service and we're able to watch our quality because we're a lot smaller. We're able to really pay attention to everything from the field to the time it gets to the factory. Reporting from Hawkinsville, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, Damon, nice job, sir. That is going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's in the world of farming that's going on and the Farm Monitor show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. As always, have a great week.